do some boom with me, and then that's where we're gonna start this episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> boom, boom. Chicka, boom, chicka, boom, 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 chicka, boom, boom. <laughs> that was Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. Welcome to Boom. We have Biomechanics on Our Minds. Boom. 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 I am Melissa. And I am Melissa. <laughs> We're both <laughs> Melissa today. Um, Just kidding, I'm Hannah. That's Hannah. We're both grad students at Stanford University, and Biomechanics on Our Minds is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. Welcome back, Melissa. Ah, thanks, Hannah. Just got back from the World Congress of Biomechanics in Dublin. Did I say Dublin? Dublin. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It was in Dublin, Ireland. Too many Guinnesses. It was a huge conference. There was over 4,000 people there and a wide range of topics in biomechanics from the cellular level to bigger scale biomechanics and um, animal biomechanics. So it was just, it was uh, awesome to see such a range of topics there. Boom was promoted at the World Congress of Biomechanics, which was exciting. It was well received. (laughs) Yeah. Mostly by um, the members of ISB that know what Boom is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> But that was exciting. Um, so thank you for all of the ISB members that showed support for Boom and uh, our Boom fans in Ireland. So on today's episode, we have an interview with Professor Ruben Govender and Professor Emeritus Gerald Nurek, who work at the University of Cape Town in the Blast Impact and Survivability Research Unit. And I actually worked with them a bit when I did research at the University of Cape Town. So we call it BISRU, the Blast Impact and Survivability Research Unit. BISRU is <laughs> That short. is so many letters. <laughs> I know, and it's it's a lot of words. Um, but what's cool is that they really have a focus on survivability, and it's the blast impact. So they actually have a blast chamber. Um, we don't get to this until later in the interview, but I think it's cool to mention that they actually have a chamber where they set off explosives and look at what? the types of forces that are applied. Um, sometimes it's like in, under sand and um, on force plates or with different types of metals. Did you get to go in there? Well, you don't go in there, oh. but you can look at it. Um, and oh. it, it's I like see, funny. there's no blast impact on humans. <laughs> like, you, no, no, no. <laughs> it's usually, I think it's for more like designing like vehicles and things that are going to be going in places where I there should be explosions. Um, but also protective wear. There hasn't been any human experiments <laughs> that I'm aware of. And it was funny because you would be upstairs doing research on your computer and then you'd hear like a huge boom and be like, all right, something just went off. And it was kind of freaky at first. Did you just say? Boom. <laughs> Did someone say Did someone boom? Say boom? <laughs> <laughs> and I actually got to go to there through an International Society of Biomechanics grant. And they have grants to travel to other places and do research. And that was kind of my first exposure to the International Society of Biomechanics. I hadn't, hadn't applied to anything like that before, so I didn't feel like I was qualified or I was like kind of worried about that. But then it ended up working out, and it was a really awesome experience. You had a blast. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Well, this is awesome, so you should also apply to ISB if you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get them. Uh, oh, wait. We should start with a bit of boom, right? Did we forget to do a bit of boom? Almost. Bit of boom. Bit of boom. Bit of boom. Bit of boom. So about a week ago, a study came out saying that Nike's $250 running shoes will actually make you run faster. And this New York Times article published by Kevin Queeley and Josh Katz on July 18th explores the efficacy of Nike Vaporfly shoes, which are some super high-tech running shoes that'll cost you 250 officially but upwards of 400 to we even saw i think like 1200 <laughs> yeah on we the... saw like a bidding war for the chrome colored for so like you want to look cool <laughs> while and... you're running so the authors found that they were actually four percent better than some of nike's and other leading companies best racing shoes um what do you, yeah, what does that 4% actually mean? Uh, and it's really cool that the article 
discusses what this means in a number of different ways. It can translate to six minutes to a three-hour marathoner or an eight-minute improvement to a four-hour marathoner. It's a lot for someone running a marathon. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's like almost a mile, right? That's like, or multiple miles even. Yeah. So they use race data from 500,000 marathon and half marathon running times since 2014 and did statistical analyses on the data that they could collect from public race reports and shoe records from Strava. Yeah. And it's really cool. They also doing statistics sometimes I think can, I can get a little muddled up in all of the details and it feels like you can sometimes find trends in any kind of data, but they were very careful with their statistics and made sure to account for a lot of things when they were doing their analyses, a number of confounding factors and things like that. And they actually found that this 4% difference wasn't explained by faster runners, for example, choosing to wear these specific shoes or by runners choosing to wear them in easier races or by runners mm-hmm. then switching to these shoes after running more training miles. Like, they weren't suddenly like, oh, I'm going to wear the nice shoe after I've trained a lot. Um, and rather, this analysis actually suggests that in a race between two marathoners of the same ability, a runner wearing vapor flies would have a real advantage over a competitor not wearing them. Yeah, it was really cool to see how they did their comparisons. And even the finish times were... Uh, close to 4% faster, actually, when the same runners just switched to the vapor fly. That is so cool. So maybe I should just go spend $250 and get 4% fast. Is it worth the money? Mm-hmm. What's the technology behind this? What makes them faster? So unlike most running shoes, they have a carbon fiber plate in the midsole, which actually stores and releases energy with each stride, which energy that's normally lost. And so this is sort of meant to act as a kind of slingshot or catapult that propels runners forward. And however, the vapor flies do have some disadvantages that they're actually believed to wear out quicker than normal training shoes or other training shoes. Um, and even some runners report losing the effectiveness after 100 miles or so of these particular mm, shoes. So you have to be really strategic about when you're going to spend all of your money. But it was neat because they also said that the advantages that runners have when they wear vapor flies, they found that um, it was similar across runners, whether they're faster or slower, and um, for both men and women, and even people, um, whether they were just beginning to run marathons or whether they had run multiple marathons before. So it's not just on a certain uh, demographic of people. It's hard to tell like what would let you go faster for that period of time, whether it, you're not putting as much energy into it, so you're able to maintain a faster speed for a longer period of time, or whether it's like purely like speed. Even though these re- researchers can't necessarily look at what caused those mm-hmm. benefits in, in their study because they're just relying on this publicly available data, mm-hmm. they did find that the results were consistent with similar speed increases found in a Nike-funded study done at the University of Colorado, where um, researchers actually measured the metabolic cost um, of 18 elite male runners running at a, on a treadmill at different speeds, and they, they actually found that runners wearing the vapor flies spent 4% less energy um, than they did when they were wearing different racing shoes. Okay. So this was consistent with the finding that they had in this like publicly available data set. Just um, the actual University of Colorado study found a larger effect than the one here. Yeah, I think there is definitely room for more studies like this and using these huge amounts of data. Um, there's a lot of things that we can discover with of new statistical learning techniques. So I think this is one of many interesting studies that will come out. I think it'll be difficult figuring out how to combine data when it's uh, measured differently. Um, I know there's a lot of different methods for collecting data and different devices that are collecting data. And so I think that's going to be probably a challenge with it. And I wonder if there's going to be more publications on standardizing, suggest standardizing yeah, the way that you're, the people are collecting data like that. Although a lot of this data and, and this massive amounts is just coming from like cell phones. Yeah, right. You definitely st- still fall subject to 
having a lot of unknown error like in the measurements that yeah definitely you typically phones are accurate and where they're at like gps but if you want to look at biomechanics it's going to be more difficult and thinking about where people have their phone located and things like that but this is an awesome study so and it has a lot of really awesome interactive graphs that also makes me it makes me appreciate studies more i think when they present their data and like sort of a tangible, fun way. Yeah, a fun, interactive um, way. So y'all should check it out at the New York Times online. <laughs> now we're going to jump into our interview. I'm here with Professor Ruben Govender and Professor Emeritus Gerald Nurek, or Ruben and Prof, as we typically call them at the lab. They both work at the Blast Impact and Survivability Research Unit, or BISRU, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Thank you for talking with us today. And Prof, why don't you start us off telling us a little bit about what's going on in the lab, what type of research you are involved in right now? Well, I'm going to let Ruben talk about biomechanics in a third world country because that's basically what he's heading towards and that's what his passion is now. I'll just quickly introduce Bizru which actually stands for Blast Impact and Survivability Research Unit. And we are mainly involved in looking at all types of impact problems, going from impact biomechanics right through to blast loading of structures, because within a blast loaded structure, you are going to get human injury, uh, and you want to be able to try and help by understanding what the, how the structure is responding and therefore what's going to happen to the human body on the other side of the structure, be it in a land-protected vehicle or in a just in an ordinary uh, bomb, which tends to go into various places uh, around the world. So really part of it, long, long-term aim is to be able to have computational models to be able to help researchers get into this. But we are along the way, but a long way from the end. But the aim is sort of obviously any any computational model you have, um, whether you're talking about a fluid dynamics or a solid mechanics type simulation, you've got to have really good material models, right? Otherwise, you've got bad material models, You your simulation really doesn't mean very much. Um, and so I'm, I'm thinking back to you know, really just before you arrived here and Prof Nurek and I started this conversation uh, and we were looking at, at where we we're going with all of this. Trevor Clutie, who you met over here, has been doing a lot of work on bone, which is a hard tissue within the human body. And I think Bizru has done a lot of work in terms of characterizing the material properties of bone all the way from quasi-static through intermediate, through high strain rates, uh, and developing um, some new models that can be used to predict the behavior of bone, particularly it, its stiffness and some of the fracture strains, etc., cetera, um, under impact loading. But, you know, sort of when you get to the kind of impact loading where bones are breaking, you're really talking about quite advanced trauma. The, the, the person in that scenario has taken a big hit already. And so Prof and I were talking when this all started out in terms of the what about you know, somewhere lower than that, right? What about the kind of injuries that occur where, you know, if you think in sports, when somebody's wearing protective gear and they take a big hit in a tackle or they get hit in the head by a ball or something like that, they're not necessarily going to break bones, but there's definitely sort of soft tissue damage underneath that. And that you're trying to design your protective gear to be able to mitigate or minimize any kind of soft tissue injury as a start and whether that's sports or that could also be from civilian to military applications a policeman who's wearing some kind of body armor in a riot situation or even in kind of uh, hazardous environments like a mine etc where you've got a lot of rock and fragments flying around people wear some kind of personal protective gear to to stop that and you need you need to be able to model those and understand how much of that impact energy do you absorb before the person actually gets hurt? You know, when when do they bruise? When does the blow actually break the skin and cause much more muscle damage, etc.? So I think that was kind of where we were kicking off just before you arrived. Hence, you know, you remember some of your projects where we were looking at 
uh, you know, sticking a knife blade through skin and what the forces were involved in this. And I think sort of a little while after you were here, um, I started having some conversations with the folk over our medical school. There was this, right, great. So, you know, we can set up these mechanical experiments and we can try to measure these forces, etc. But when we were thinking about damage criteria for soft tissue, unlike bone, where bone, it fractures. If it hasn't fractured, you're still okay. Right. Whereas soft tissue, what does it mean for the tissue to actually be damaged? You know, that that's not a trivial question in and of itself. And so I kind of made some contacts over our medical school and I went over to chat to Prof. Nonsanta Kumalo, who is the head of dermatology at Curtis Gear Hospital, to sort of start this conversation off. And in my conversation with her, I kind of realized of that testing and modeling certainly at and UCT, and it seems in the broader scope of universities in South Africa, while people are doing research on biomechanics, there does not seem to be any facility where people are able to take soft tissue and test the mechanical properties of it. Yeah, and it seems like if you're at the point where there's some sort of impact and bone is breaking, you're going to be having substantial damage to the soft tissue around it. And it seems like soft tissues are much more difficult to understand and know what's going on and heal. No, it, exactly. And so there was this idea, well, trying to find out what those injury criteria were and then finding out that uh, actually whenever any South African researchers who were wanting mechanical properties of soft tissues were doing work, that they were either using data from the literature or trying to go overseas and do their tests over there, which, of course, causes a massive problem because um, transporting any kind of biological substance across international borders is a problem, and trying to transport human tissue and keep it viable across you know, an intercontinental flight. Why were they going overseas for testing? Well, because there was no facility in South Africa. Uh, just nobody was doing this work. Nobody was set up. Uh, you know, if you just think in terms of the the forces involved in doing a tensile test on a piece of skin, you were talking about you know a few hundred newtons at best, and that in South Africa, materials test facilities are normally testing engineering materials. They consider things like plastics to be on the softer end of what they can test. So nobody really nobody really had this, and so. Chatting to Prof Kamala and then also chatting to some people over in the cardiovascular research unit uh, at UCT. Prof Nurek has um, long-standing relationships with some of the people who've worked over there. But again, people are going, you know, we just we don't have this facility to get these properties. And so that's kind of where I've wandered into now. Is going, we'll get to the dynamic stuff at some point, but actually, and we. Can we just do the tests to test uh, thin membranes like skin? And it, it's not just skin, um, any kind of other membrane in the body, the pericardium, most of your digestive tract is, is a membrane of some sort. Can we get the testing methodology right to be able to do that locally? Yeah. I mentioned Prof Kamala from Dermatology, who she was very interested in this uh, because she said that the majority of work that's been done on, um, you know, in the dermatology field in terms of cosmetic products and treatments, etc., because it comes from Western countries, is done on Caucasian test subjects. Right. People, people understand this on a superficial level that a European person's skin is quite different from an African person's skin in terms of not just color and melanin content, but also in terms of the elastic properties of it and you know how does the skin change as it as it ages etc and so they've been doing a lot of work in terms of when you treat skin with a product that's been tested on a demographic group is you know being used on one whose skin has actually got quite different properties different things come out some treatments are less effective some are more effective you know, all of these issues are at play. So they were really quite excited about the idea of now being able to test locally where you can go, right, here is African skin and what are its properties and that, you know, one day getting to the point where you can go, well, if you've, you know, treated a patient 
and you're wanting to test skin properties in vivo, how is their skin responding to, to all of that? But that's sort of, that's very, very far down the line I think, from where we are at the moment. What kind of mechanical tests do you do? So at the moment, really, what we're working with is getting the, as we do in business, sort of getting the methodologies right and understanding everything that we need to in terms of doing the test from an engineering perspective very, very well. So what we're focusing on at the moment is bulge testing. So if you remember what you were working with, where we were sort of stretching skin like a drum skin, going, well, actually now, you know, let's just inflate that, Mm -hmm. right, and create biaxial tension in the skin because that also mimics very closely what the skin experiences in normal loading on the body. And then with a combination of bulge test and a finite element simulation where you're sort of trying to, you, you're looping through, trying to optimize your, your material properties to get a good fit for that. So I've got a couple of students working on that at the moment. Uh, one of the additional challenges with this is actually measuring measuring the deformation um, and that it, it, it's skin. You can't, as soon as you touch it with any kind of probe, it deforms, so it's all non-contact stuff. So working with imaging things like digital image correlation, and we're looking at a couple of other systems at the moment uh, involving laser scanning, et cetera, to try and get the deformation profiles because skin being anisotropic because of the fibers, uh, even if you've got a circular clamp and you've got a uniform pressure underneath it, it stretches more in one direction than the other. So you don't get a hemispherical bulge. You get kind of an elliptic bulge. Being able to visualize that and measure that tells you something about the properties of the skin and the orientation of the fibers that are underlying it. You mentioned that some of the tests have only been done on specific demographics, and I was wondering if this also affects the types of impacts that you'll be testing for that differs from in different places in the world or what other effects might being in different locations around the world have on your research. So one of the things that is a really pressing need in South Africa, um, you would have seen some of the informal settlements over here where, um, you know, things that were referred to in the past as shanty towns or squatter camps, etc., where a massive problem in those areas is fire. If you have a fire broke breaking out in one of those dwellings, it tends to jump to the other dwelling very, very quickly um, and spread out of control. And so burn wounds and burn victims, very often people who suffer burns over a huge portion of their body, um, are a much bigger problem in South Africa around informal settlements than they are in the rest of the world, right? Where all the rest of the world, but you know, certainly in places where you don't have these kinds of um, settlements and people living in these kinds of conditions. Because very often people living in those settlements are using paraffin stoves or burning wood fires, etc., for cooking. Um, they don't have electric stoves. They don't have sort of safe gas stoves to use. So fire and burn wounds are a big, big problem. Um, and so for the dermatology people over here, understanding that and sort of looking at one of the things that they're looking at are different kinds of burn treatments with artificial skin and being able to seed the skin with patient cells, etc., to try and regrow the skin after they've had these massive burns is an area that sort of, in terms of the South African public health space, that's quite an important thing for people to put effort into. And that that's uh, in a, you know, not that you don't have burn victims in in more well-off societies, but the number of patients and the extent to which the people are burned tends to be much, much smaller. So the folk that I'm collaborating with in dermatology are, are quite interested when they do these treatments, you know, if they, they in a lab can simulate some of the artificial skin specimens that they're growing and simulate some of the treatments that they're working on, how do the properties of those, of that, you know, regrown skin, how does it compare to what the patient might have had naturally? Because obviously the closer you can, you can match that, the less scarring there is, the more they'll be able to move freely post recovery, etc. 
I know that you mentioned before that some of the testing, they were taking it overseas because there wasn't equipment or facilities. And I was wondering, Prof, you might have a good idea of how it's changed since you started working in the field to now. Look, biomechanics, the concept of biomechanics started here uh, when your previous speaker, Brian Davis, was a student here and he com- commented on that. So we're talking good 40 years ago. But because biomechanics was basically situated at medical school and we were up on the upper campus in, in engineering, there was a divide. And I think that's common around the world over the years. It's, it's only quite recent and everybody was, and it, it's common around the world where everybody is trying to apply for the same part of money. And even people down the same corridors don't work together because they're trying to apply for the same part of money. But that is changing. And really, I'm a great believer in collaboration with whomever. So the concept of knowing people and collaborating brought you to this country. So there's a perk in itself. But the fact that people are now pushing down those ivory towers and those concrete walls between the different disciplines, and I see it happening worldwide, which is fantastic, is very good as on the international scale. It's still going to be a problem here because our funding has reduced for research over the years, and everybody is really doing what they can to keep their own research going. But I think you just need one or two champions to start bridging that gap. You know, research is done by people who talk to people, not by emails or um, by letters. It's actually done by people who talk to people. So despite what we are doing now and seeing one another, uh, it's taken a long time to get here to talk to one another like this. Uh, over the years, it's been a very slow process. It will get easier. I'm not sure the funding will get any better, but it will get easier to talk to people. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. Was the lab already there when you became the director of it? No. So you started it. I inherited a small lab from um, the late John Martin, who was a full professor at Brown for many years before he came back to South Africa in the early 70s. And he was a theoretician, a, a well-known man in plastic and plasticity. Uh, and he was interested to know things about high strain rates. And he, he started the lab, but he, in the end, it was experimentalists who took over it, such as myself, and developed it into from just a blast lab into a more structural impact lab. Uh, and then, fortunately, I was lucky enough to get uh, four four young people who were interested. And here we are with a, a, a really nice band of people who can c- carry on the work in their own different ways. Yeah, that's really amazing. And how have you seen the field of biomechanics change during that time? Oh, it's changed dramatically, absolutely dramatically. Um, I, I think the introduction of new data acquisition, whatever it was, high-speed cameras, electronics, uh, if you look to see how these things have developed over the last 20 years and particularly over the last five to 10 years, to be able to get data in a much more friendly environment and to be able to interpret that data, uh, which you wouldn't have been able to do 20 years ago, has made a huge leap in the understanding of the human body and its functioning and it, and the impact response of it. One thing I'm really interested in is starting research labs in economically developing countries. And so I was wondering your opinion with your experience on starting a new lab, what that is like and what kind of resources or help would be useful to developing a biomechanics lab in an economically developing country. So I, I think something that I and I was I probably should have done this about two years earlier in my career. Um, once I knew that I, I wanted to start working with biological tissues, etc., is if you're an engineering student who is wanting to get into biomechanics, then go and talk to the people in your health sciences faculty at your medical school. Go find out what people are working on over there. Similarly, if you're a, you know, you're a person who's coming from a health sciences, physiology or medicine background, go and find some people 
in the engineering faculty and talk to them and find out what's, what's going on in their space. What kind of facilities do they have? Because you know, there's sort of method in this madness. It's a lot easier. And I found myself, it's a lot easier to motivate yourself to work hard at a really challenging engineering problem when you can see the benefit to a human being in, in a very, very immediate way. And that's something that the people in health sciences generally don't struggle with. They're working with patients. And, you know, if they, if you've contributed in some way to making a treatment a little bit better, even if, you know, the engineering part of it wasn't necessarily groundbreaking or, you know, huge complicated rocket science, those patients are just so overjoyed at the difference that you've made in their life. And that can be a really, really powerful motivator for you putting more effort and energy into your research. Um, and, and that's that's been quite a strong theme in, in my life. And that similarly for the folk from health sciences, uh, you know, very often doctors in South Africa is not a, not a third world country, but but we definitely train our doctors to be able to go and operate in spaces where they have very limited resources, very little access to first world technology. Um, and, and that means that, no offense, I've got some fantastic friends who have trained as doctors, but, but they're often quite ignorant about modern tech and what one can do with sort of modern engineering technology, particularly in a research world where people are open sourcing their designs and going, I came up with this device. Here's the CAD model. Right, I don't. I don't want to sell it to you. I'm giving you the design. If you want to try and build this thing and use it in your application, go ahead. Um, you know, they might know about it, but they don't have the engineering skill to actually then take that design and realize it into something physical and helpful that they can use. So I think having those conversations on a more local level, so you can work on locally relevant problems. And that, you know, I, I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, if I've looked at things under a microscope, it's been metal samples and polymers, and things like that. I'm not used to looking at cells and collagen fibers and all those sorts of things under a microscope. I just haven't been trained to do that. And for me to try and build the skill to look at those things would take a huge amount of effort. And, and that's frankly unnecessary where if I can go and establish a working relationship with people in the health sciences who are skilled at those things, and they can go, don't don't try to take that image of tissue, right? It just, you know, people have been trying to do that for 50 years and they've never made it work. Then, you know, then they can guide you in that direction and that they can bring their expertise to your project as well as sort of giving you you know, giving you some application for where your research goes, they can also definitely feed in at various stages and, and guide you in that way. So I think those relationships are incredibly powerful. Yeah. And what are you most excited for in the field of biomechanics moving forward? So many, so many That's different a things. Question. The, the movement uh, and it's not it's not restricted to biomechanics, but I think the move towards sort of open data in researchers and the fact that people are becoming more open about uh, when they design a tool or a device of some kind, that these designs are not becoming the intellectual property of some corporation that is going to now try and sell them at substantial profit to wherever particularly in the African context where uh, the average person doesn't have a lot of money towards healthcare uh, and the facilities are not great. So anything in that sense that allows us to do better science for less money is incredibly helpful. And these days you look at the way you can build instrumentation. The open source movement is making it more and more easy you know, for you to work with things like building blocks where you don't necessarily have to know the tiny, tiny detail of how a particular sensor worked. Somebody goes, here's the, the schematic of the sensor. Here's a code block that you can use to capture data from that sensor and use it in your experiment. And they've made that freely available. And in the past, your only option was to buy that sensor from 
a company based somewhere else where, you know, when, when you're in South Africa, the exchange rate is not great. So anytime you buy something that's priced in US dollars or euros or pounds, you're generally taking quite a hit on it. But now if somebody's going, here's my plan. Make it yourself. There's my code. Use it. Tell people that you use my code and tell people that you use my design and I'm, I'm really happy. And I think that, that that attitude, not just in biomechanics, but, you know, just across the research world is enabling people to get up off the ground so much faster. You talked about starting a lab from scratch. In, in the past, if somebody wanted to start a lab from scratch and they didn't have I think the prof, you would know these numbers better than me, something like three to five million rand to bankroll this, they weren't going anywhere because how did you buy, you know, how did you buy a microscope? How did you buy um, a tensile test frame? How did you buy anything to, you know, a, a motion capture system, anything like this to get moving? Now, if you think about what I just mentioned, motion capture, I would not be surprised if, Somebody designs a cell phone app sooner rather than later, whereby you can have a couple of cell phones doing 3D motion capture of something. That can be the starting basis for somebody, you know, really in a, in, in a space where they don't have money for things like high speed cameras and dedicated motion capture facilities to actually start doing some useful work. I think that the, that lowering the barrier to entry is, is, something that's really we, we can all be quite excited about yeah i think that is quite exciting and what are you, what are your thoughts prof well again uh, i don't have a strong feeling of what's going to happen in the next 20 years because when we look where we've come from in the last 20 years sitting there i would never have thought we was, would be sitting out talking to one another like this but i, I think big data uh, as ruben mentioned is going to enable people to work closer with one another. As people have the feeling of sharing, I think when you go across borders like engineering to medicine and you go into these cross disciplines, you've got to really be a person who's prepared to share and work and learn. We've got to break down the barriers that are keeping people apart. There are some universities that have got biomechanics departments now, which transgresses surgical techniques with computational finite element analysis, which you never thought would happen 20 years ago. I see that bridging of the gap becoming a bit bigger and bigger thing to overcome than the technology itself. I think people need to also be prepared to bridge the gap between ourselves. Academia is a, a fight for survival in many cases. So everybody's looking after their own little pot and will only share it if there's a benefit. And I think sometimes there will be a benefit and sometimes there won't. And one's got to go with the highs as well as the lows. So I think that, you know, we hinted a lot of the multidisciplinary stuff and um, we've, we've talked about, you know, as Prof said, breaking down barriers, etc. And I think for a the, the way one approaches a, a research career these days or, you know, if you're wanting to work commercially in, in the biomechanics or bioengineering field these days is really, really quite different. In the past, traditionally, an academic was somebody who had a very focused, in-depth knowledge, but about a very, very narrow field. Uh, and, and I've seen this at, at mechanics conferences where, you know, people go in and they'll, they'll go into a session and they're talking about their niche area. And there'll be a handful of people who sit in the room and listen to that because you know, the session next door, which is its own niche area, isn't their thing. So they're not, you know, they don't, they don't even want to consider that body of theories. And when you start working in a, a multidisciplinary field, you have to be able to have conversations with people who didn't have the same specialized training as you. You're not trying to replicate their skill set. You're not, you're not trying to go out and be somebody who's got a bachelor degree in engineering and has basic medical or physiology qualification. But you know, when I go and talk to our collaborators at the medical school, if I can't explain fairly detailed engineering concepts in ways that they can digest and that they can grapple with, 
the conversation goes nowhere. And at the same time, for them to be able to put the cellular level descriptions of things and some of the molecular biology, et cetera, in terms that, that I can understand, I appreciate is also a challenge from their side. And so moving forward in the field, you're continuously learning and you're trying to broaden your base and you're trying to learn a little bit more about fields that are just to the side of what you're doing. Yes, you want to be advancing the science in your focus area, but sometimes to advance the science in your focus area, you've got to understand what does the research world look like just a little bit to the left or the right of you before you can move forward. It's sometimes it's not even that you're not interested in it, but I remember talking to my advisor about how I was going to different talks and trying to get a better understanding of different areas of the field. And some of them, I'm like, I really couldn't understand anything. Why? I just don't know enough. And he said, you know, that's not your fault. If you can't understand it, it's because it's not being conveyed to you in a way that makes sense and that is easily accessible to people not in that specific area. And that was something I thought was really interesting and made me think about how I talk about my own research. Do you have any advice for being able to talk about your research in a way that's more accessible for people? Being able to talk to one of your parents or a grandparent who hasn't had specialized education you have is incredibly important. It also ties back to some of what, what we do working in the spaces in South Africa. If you're a researcher who's going to go out and work with patients in an area where people aren't wealthy, they haven't had great educations. You cannot try and explain things to them in the way you would talk to your colleagues about it. If these people don't have buy-in for what you're doing, if they don't understand you, they're not going to trust you. And that means that that research project is very likely to go nowhere. So your capacity to be able to talk respectfully and convey these sometimes slightly more complicated theories to people who don't have that education, incredibly important in the context in which we sit over here. How one does that well, I'm still learning. Trying to explain to a 12-year-old is not a, not a bad place to start because very often, you know, their kids are fascinated by things, but you've got to, you've got to really think about it and give them a good picture, but give them a picture that they can digest. I think if you have little examples of things you do for children, but have them so that they can see what's going on. So that they, they don't have to imagine. They can physically get a feel for them. And today it's going in that direction. Ruben will tell you that he's playing a lot with machines that can make 3D parts. And if you can do that a lot easier, you can actually explain things a lot easier to people. Yeah, by actually having some sort of physical device or something that they can touch and see and, and better understand. One thing that we talk about on the podcast, I know that you said that you've listened to a couple. We started having a segment of research fails, and on our last episode, actually, we haven't um, released it yet, but the professor talks about how there's really no such thing as a failure in research. You know, we can always learn from it, but I was wondering if you had any stories of a time that you felt you had some sort of research fail and what you might have learned from it. Can I make two points on that? (laughs) The first one is many years ago, I went to a conference that had a special session called Experiments That Went Wrong. And I learned so much from that because none of that ever gets published. Right. And it was one of the really interesting sessions that I've ever been to. So although we don't want to publish or talk about the things that went wrong, we learn a huge amount of things that went wrong. And one of my experiences in the blast chamber I set off an experiment, opened the door, and we had a huge fire in the lab. So we had to move very quickly to douse it down. But I've never mentioned that anywhere in my publications. And uh, so there there is a lot of stuff behind the successful work that everybody writes about of things that went wrong. And you're absolutely right. Those are just really interesting, interesting things that happen. Yeah, it's true. It would be nice if there was a little supplemental section to publications on you know, here's all the other things that we tried, which it would probably end up being longer than the paper itself. But it's <laughs> so that that is a you know echoing Prof's comment about having somewhere where you can air these mistakes. And we often joked about the fact that it'd be great to have a journal called "Things We Tried But You Shouldn't." 
<laughs> yeah, so I, I, and your prof was mentioning these things. You know, when you work in the blast and impact world, um, think, things can go wrong. Right? And I, I don't know whether I ever told prof this story. We were commissioning um, a gas gun. It was a little one being built by a, a final year student who I was co-supervising. And we were at the stage where, you know, we could pressurize this thing and we wanted to do a test shot. But we didn't have the, the projectiles that it had been designed for yet. And so we were kind of looking around. There was this plastic pen lying around. And I went, okay, well, you know, this plastic pen barrel is about the right diameter and length of the projectile. And so we took the, we took the nib out because we're like, well, the pen nib is sharp. So let's do this, take it out. And there's a clear passage in it. And let's just, you know, fire this at low pressures and just to see that the gas gun is behaving the way it should. And there's a hole down the center of this, this pen barrel. How fast can it come out? Turns out when, when you've designed a gas gun to fire a half kilogram steel projectile, when you put a five gram plastic tube in it, even if the tube is hollow, it comes out the barrel really, really fast. <laughs> we hadn't thought about this. And this thing must have come out at about 50 or 60 meters a second because it hit the end stop and bounced off and kind of speared the roof. And there I was. I was a PhD student at the time supposedly teaching final year engineering students how to impact experiments safely. And we go, where are the fragments of this plastic pen? Is anybody bleeding? <laughs> I think despite some of our little stories, because we work in the field that we work in, in impact and blast, we are particularly careful when we do experiments so that nobody will get hurt or injured. But yes, things will go wrong, not because we want them to go wrong, but just sometimes we over, overthink things. I, I, I like to tell my students that experience is a consequence of surviving your mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you made a good point working in the blast impact and survivability research unit. It's research that needs to be done, but it's different. It's a different risk than some of our fails have been breaking a beaker. And, you know, in your case, it's actually really risky for, for a person to be to be doing you know, it goes back to the issue of DuPont, who were the manufacturers of explosives. They had a particularly good record for incidences because they were particularly careful on how they did things. Great. Well, thank you for talking with me. And I'm really excited for where your work is going. And I think it's really great that there's kind of making a shift based on the conversations that you've had with people outside of the field. And I think that's something that we could really learn from. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, just to thank you for, for doing this and, and also sort of good luck. really excited oh. to see young yeah. people it's in the research field using, um, it, we talked about journal papers and stuff, but I think the younger generation is really embracing the newer ways of disseminating information and learning and that you don't need a subscription for somebody to listen to your podcast and to start associating names of people with the research that is happening. Um, you know, and I think about the number of research labs around the world that have YouTube channels of what they're doing and that, uh, you know, these sorts of media for people to be able to get some publicity for their research and to bring younger people into the field and also for perhaps other people to realize, hey, this is going on. Um, there's tremendous value in all of that. So well done for this initiative. Absolutely. I think we're, you know, we're really glad to see you helping disseminate knowledge in this oh, way. It's a very good initiative. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm excited to have this interview because it's really meaningful to me to be able to circle back and talk with you guys and, and be able to share what you guys do in the lab because I know I really loved my experience there and I still talk to a lot of the people in the lab and um, they all are have a really important part in my life which is is really nice and I would encourage any student to go do research somewhere else in the world because I know it was a really amazing experience for me yeah. okay excellent all right thanks for chatting to us all right we going home and you're going to have breakfast yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> Well, a big thank you to Ruben Govender and Gerald Nurek for an awesome interview and for sharing with us all of those different experiences that they had and 
I also especially think it's interesting that they talked about this shift from their research focus and having to sort of adapt and evolve. I think I always tend to think of labs as being very fixed in what they're studying, mm-hmm. and they've got a very strong foundation in that. But um, but really being adaptable and being flexible and able to shift to where the field needs you to be or where your yeah where just research needs to be done. I think is a huge. A yeah, huge, exactly. Yeah, and he wouldn't have still. known that unless he took the time and made the effort to go talk to people in the hospital mm-hmm. and figure out what is really needed. And so I think that was a really important lesson that he talked about. And also talking to people around you locally and figuring out what are the mm-hmm. needs in your specific area, because uh, um, he mentioned that a lot of the times with different demographics of people, you need to be doing research a little bit differently. And I thought it was interesting how when researchers wanted to do research in South Africa before, a lot of times they had to actually leave the country to go do research. Like they would take organs and things with them overseas to go actually have the equipment to do that. And so it was interesting learning about that and how, how much it's changed. Uh, recently. Yeah, it always, I think I'm always inspired by stories where people are genuinely just pushing to do the best they can do and they're doing whatever they can to get that done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now let's talk about when people do the best they can do, but sometimes (laughs) it ends in something funny. One of our research fails for today has to do with people in research. And um, I like to think about science and remember that no matter how technological we get in science, at the end of the day, we still have to rely on, you know, interacting with people and interpreting data from a human perspective and things like that. Uh, some machine learning or robotics people might disagree with me there, but um, <laughs> at least for the moment, I'm going to stand my ground there. <laughs> and so one of one of our Boom listeners actually said that when she was meeting her advisor for the first time, she was a little bit nervous and he came up to her, super big smile on his face, very welcoming, reached out his right hand, as you would, to shake her hand. And his left hand was sort of just dangling nearby, (laughs) I guess in a somewhat ambiguous way. (laughs) So that when she reached like a normal person would to shake his right hand, she also thought that he wanted to be shaken with her left hand as well. So she went for the two-handed shake. She went for a shake. two-handed shake, but like, you know, you could imagine your hands cross as you're reaching to for the opposite, the opposite hand. hands. And yeah. Um, yeah, so her first interaction with her future advisor was in this <laughs> really, really awkward, awkward two-handed, <laughs> two-handed handshake. <laughs> and um, I really love that story because, you know, it worked out in the end. That didn't deter him from <laughs> accepting yeah. her in the lab. And uh, yeah, now they shake hands normally all the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, they've to never day, had another they have awkward never handshake. had to have another um, Yeah, I love funny interactions between advisors and um, the students. And one thing I've had to be careful of is checking my email after I've had a drink or two because I'll just respond. But (laughs) generally it's okay. But one time I was trying to order a patient bed for someone to just lay down on for imaging. And I sent a couple different bed options to my advisor. And one of them was this bright blue bed. And he emailed me back and was like, I like this bed, but why don't we pick a more understated color? Other than blue. And I thought that he said understandable color. I emailed him back like, I don't really know why blue is an understandable color. Blue is my favorite color, and I think it's a good color. (laughs) And and, uh, he emailed me back, and he was like, I think blue is a great color, but I think maybe something a little less bright and just a little little more subtle would be good. And I read through, and I was like, oh, understated. That makes more sense. It gets a quick response back, surprisingly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, I mean, you do you. Yeah. Like, whatever works. Sometimes I feel like my emails just don't get read. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most of mine don't get read unless I'm saying something ridiculous. And then it's, and then it's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. I've definitely had emails where the other person tries to schedule something on a day that doesn't exist, like February 31st. <laughs> definitely does not, <laughs> not going to work out for us. <laughs> I'm busy that day. <laughs> Become an ISV student member. The con- it's almost 
Well, yeah, it's like one year until the Congress <gasps> next year in Calgary, and I'm super Ooh. excited. It's going to be so fun. Um, there's going to be awesome student events, and we have a women in biomechanics event planned. It's open for men and women, so I think that'll be a really fun night. Lots of cool activities planned, and lots of biomechanics will be happening. So mm-hmm. get excited for that. We'll be there. Yes. And you can also follow ISB on Twitter at IS Biomechanics and like us on Facebook. And if you become an ISB student member, you can join our Facebook student group. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you again to all of the ISB council members. We had our council meetings in Dublin this year, and everyone was really supportive of the podcast. Actually, we just started playing it in the middle of the council meetings, which was really fun. <laughs> and then I know a few of the council members talked about it at the end of their presentations. I really appreciate that. This has been super fun, and we're hoping to continue doing Forever. the podcast. <laughs> so if you like the podcast, share them with your friends and talk to us and reach out to us and tell us what you want to hear about. Tell us a research fail or not a fail. Tell us something exciting you're doing in research so we can be excited for you. You can email us at isb.studentrepresentative at gmail.com. Biomechanics off our minds.